Um, okay, I, I just uh, I kind of apologise for the title, Rooting for Recovery. I should have had full call and something about Ibogaine, Iboga. Uh, it might have been a bit um, difficult for people to understand what they're coming to. I've got a radio mic on me. Oh, right, that's a good idea. <laughs> Hearing myself coming back in myself. Um, okay, the, um, so I, 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 I'm a documentary maker. I'm not wouldn't really describe myself as an advocate of Ibogaine. I've got propelled into that because of a film that I made in 2004 that was on BBC One called Detox or Die. It's freely available on the internet to watch, as is my latest film. Iboga Nights, which we screened yesterday. You're welcome to find them and comment on them and get back to me. So, um, the first film dealt with uh, my addiction and my road to recovery using Ibogaine. Uh, at the time, uh, there was very little information about it. My brother was in New York and had sent me some, some literature, like 10th generation photocopy stuff. Um, quite hard to read, but I got the idea that this was um, a possibility for me to quit my long-term methadone addiction. I've been a heroin user, or a user of various opiates for, for many years in, in, um, in Scotland, in Edinburgh, in Glasgow. Uh, I'm originally from the Highlands of Scotland, and um, um, yeah, I guess the opiates gave me a sense of, of being part of something, part of this uh, subculture of the junkie and I, I bought into it. Crazy though it may seem, it did give me a sense of uh, purpose in life. Um, yeah, and I, I'm going to show you a, a couple of images. Um, my junkie life. So this is me in Edinburgh in 1986. A young man injecting and obviously I think I asked my wife to take a picture of me. So I'm obviously into the whole thing, you know, it, it's a big deal for me. I'm, I've bought into this, this um, underground culture, a, a cult of sorts, and almost something religious within it for me. I was injecting all sorts of opiates. Um, one of them especially, Dicanol, was, was very big at the time. And I'd almost describe that as a psychedelic opiate. Um, it, it was obviously designed for pain relief. But when it was injected, the tablets were mixed with water, hot water, and injected, uh, mainlined. It gave this incredible rush that was um, akin to a religious experience. I actually did see images of myself as if I was Jesus, or on the cross, or whatever. Uh, an incredible feeling. Um, but most of the time, I was sitting, taking methadone, injectable methadone, and such like. I was one of the lucky, one of the lucky people that didn't contract HIV. A lot of my friends did at the time. Edinburgh was known as the AIDS capital of Europe. And obviously you have the, the stuff like uh, train spotting and such like that is, um, that I lived through that, that kind of period in, in Edinburgh at that time. Um, an insane thing to, to buy into, but it, um, it really did give me a sense of being part of something, part of a culture, even if it was nihilistic, it, it meant something to me. So for various years afterwards, I struggled and this, <laughs> I, I, I sort of designed this myself, it's obviously a bit faked, but uh, it's me glugging a bottle of methadone, um, which I didn't really do it like that, that's a kind of cartoonized version of, of what I did, but it kind of summed up this, this need for methadone and uh, I, um, I, I did find it really helped me and I do back harm reduction. It's, it's a good thing to bring the struggling addict into the, the medical world so they can get the support and such. So yeah, I'm sitting there on methadone which is the government prescribed uh, um, alternative to heroin and such like. And uh, it did help me, I have to say, it did help me. The problem with methadone that you probably have heard is 
It's a very difficult substance to break the habit. So I'm sitting there for years and years and years on this methadone prescription. Um, and um, yeah, I was able to function. I was able to hold down jobs, have relationships. Um, there are downsides to, to taking methadone. It can be mixed with alcohol. It can um, um, affect you kind of emotionally and your, your temperament and such like. But on the whole, lived quite a normal life and stable life. So, um, though there are issues with, with methadone, I have to say, and, and in my first film, Detox or Diet, if, if you know it or have seen it, it does look like I'm hammering methadone and saying, oh God, you know, I can't get off it. This is not good at all. I've changed my mind since then. And um, I do realize uh, that harm reduction is a good policy. And especially, I loathe seeing the stuff in the newspapers about giving free drugs to junkies. By the way, I do use the word junkie in the sense of being one myself in the past. And uh, I've said this before to people like Negroes have used the word nigger. Um, I, I just use it. And I know it's not kosher within um, certain parts of society to use that word. Obviously, the media use it all the time. And I, I don't like that. But I use it in a different sense. I'm kind of reclaiming the word, word so to speak. So I'm going to come out of this, and I hope I don't... Uh, yeah, right, okay. So, um, what, as I said, my brother sent me some information and I found out about this um, stuff that hailed from Africa. And these are images of people in Gabon um, that are part of this uh, religious cult, we could call it of Buiti. And they're using this for centuries, this, uh, this sacred plant as a, as a form of um, spiritual advancement uh, using large amounts of this, this root bark. It's from a shrub. It takes quite a long time to grow. It's seven years. So, um, you know, the sustainability is an, an issue now with many people wanting to use ibogaine. And that's another thing we can go into for hours and hours. It's certainly, it, it seems like it could be running out. Um, so the people use it as this is preparing for a, a ceremony. Usually young men coming of age ceremonies uh, take vast quantities of the root bar, go into a, a, a deep um, psychedelic state, speaking to spirit ancestors. And yeah, the witch doctor, if you could call it that, uh, the person that leads it, is known as a Naganga. Um, now you're getting people that are actually, that have never been in Gabon, that are painting their faces and calling themselves 10th generation Nagangas and doing treatments. Sometimes you know, that can be a good thing if people buy into the imagery and it works for them, then that's fine. But uh, there are a lot of charlatans out there doing treatments for people, and it can be dangerous. And I have to say, there are certain people that should not be treated, and I know of, personally several people that have died taking it. One guy that was um, in my recent film that unfortunately died um, in August, I think it was, um, he shouldn't have been treated. He was quite a very, very damaged drug addict. Um, I feel a certain bit of responsibility for that because I got the idea back in his head about doing Ibogaine, though I, I really don't think he should have done it. So I'll go back to, yeah, Iboga plant. showing these pictures small um, yeah wait a minute wait a minute I think I've got it there we go so I got a professional photographer the the newspapers actually came down and did a, a piece on me this is these are images that he did this is me on the day before I do the treatment I tried to 
eat something, a, a samosa, and I'm, I'm vegan actually, and I was eating this samosa and I threw up because I was withdrawing from uh, methadone, that's the picture I took of me just before I threw up, I wasn't feeling too good. This is um, King's Cross, 2003, August. Um, <coughs> so what I'd known about this stuff is that it was a quick route for getting off methadone now. It was going to be a grueling process of 24 to 36 hours of tripping, but it would reduce the withdrawal symptoms vastly. And that's something I struggled with, with methadone. It just went on and on and on. The withdrawal from methadone is not three days of having the flu. It's weeks of sleeplessness and this all-encompassing darkness um, in your soul that eventually you just crack with it and go back on your whatever it is, methadone or dihydrocodone or morphine or, or heroin. Um, heroin actually has got less of a, a half-life. Methadone it's, it's a longer one, so it's a tough one to break. Um, but I cut down to a small amount. I'd, uh, I was going to the gym, I was eating quite well, juicing and all this stuff, building myself up. This is all in the film. These are stills um, that you can actually see um, the moving images. This is basically a, an image of the the ibogaine capsules that I was to take that morning. Now this is, uh, this is me dressed as, it's a bit of a tribute to the Bowidi, uh, but I'm not going to pretend that I'm buying into the whole African ritual thing. I made up my own ritual, what I call the methadone ghost. So yes, it was a tribute to the, the, the African Bowidi people that, that do these tribal ceremonies. But uh, that's as far as it went. I really, uh, um, yeah, it is a bit theatrical and probably for the television, but not. What I wanted was this essence of what I was, the methadone ghost, because I felt quite ghostly on this stuff. And I could almost walk through walls. It does it's such it's methadone is a psychoactive drug, and you get high on it. Um, doctors don't really like to say that, but you do get high on it. So. I wanted to cleanse myself once the stuff was over, once the, um, the, the, the um, trip was over, that I would take this face paint off and I had a white shroud on. Um, I would remove that and it would, that would be my methadone ghost gone forever. Um, so, Here's an image of me with Edward Conn. It's an anguishing, anguished moment where it's about uh, 30 minutes into the treatment, I believe, and I have a bit of a crisis. And um, it really was a, a moment of complete and utter fear that is, there, is happening there. It's in the film as well. I think it'll come across. There, there's no, um, there's, there's, there's nothing fake about it was an absolute moment of total fear because I'd heard this stuff could kill me um, and it actually had gone into pay, the local papers, sorry, the um, national papers in the um, Sunday Times, filmmaker may film his own death and um, that was preying on my mind. I've taken a bunch of this stuff that could kill me and it seems insane to take a psychedelic drug, drug when you're withdrawing. So. I was pretty scared, I'm honest with you, I was pretty scared. Now, the action of the Ibogaine is that it does lower your heart rate. That in itself can be an issue with people that have damaged hearts. When you're a crack, long-term crack heroin user, quite often your heart is quite damaged. This happened to a friend of mine, Mickey, who died in, in August. Um, after years of crack and heroin and, and other drugs, uh, his heart gave in after I think about an hour or so into his treatment. Um, he was touching 60 I believe and um, I don't think he should have done a treatment at all uh, or with micro doses of Ibogaine, not a full flood dose. This is heavy stuff. So you should, if people are doing it, they get the ECG check and um, find out you know, the liver checks 
find out whether they're up for it or not, whether it's, it's going to work for them, uh, or what, you know, whether they're healthy enough to go through this. Um, I'd got all that done, and people have got, providers have really got to be stringent about this. Some aren't, and people are dying, and that kind of stuff gets in the press. There are people out there trying to, they're just into it for the money. They'll take somebody, take them to a hotel room, leave them there all day, and then come back um, to check on them peri periodically. Um, and if the guy is dead, he's just an anon anonymous guy in a hotel room. There's no connection with the provider. And I know this has happened in Paris. Um, it's not good and it shouldn't happen. They need somebody there all the time. When I don't know if I can get an image of it, but uh, this is Edward Conn, who was my provider. He doesn't do it anymore. He does psychotherapy, um, but he does help people after uh, doing their Ibogaine. The nature of the Ibogaine is that um, you'd suffer ataxia, and it is very difficult to move around. This is Edward helping me back from the toilet your legs just buckle under you. This is another reason why you need somebody there. If you need to go to the toilet, this, you know, somebody will help you. It's also show it in Iboga nights, uh, actually, where I help somebody go through their own treatment. And uh, it's a very grueling process, but I have to say, it has got this, people have this idea of it being a very, very dark thing and, and, and extremely nasty. Once you ride into it and go through that, that wave of fear that may initially hit you, it, it, because of the way it, it relaxes the heart, you kind of ride into it and you're not going to freak out and jump out of windows or try to commit suicide. It, won't, it, it just won't happen. Um, as a thing for personal growth as well, the night before I did this full treatment, I took a small amount of Ibogaine uh, as a test dose. Now, within that, I found, um, I found it was incredible. The full, the full flood dose the next day was just, it was, it was too much to actually comprehend what was going on. But with a small dose, maybe about a quarter gram of Ibogaine hydrochloride, I felt that I was able to look at myself in a very objective manner and see some of patterns of my behaviour, things that I was doing on a daily basis, even like a little nervous cough that I did, that I didn't need to do, and was tracing it back to events as a teenager when I had very little confidence and I manufactured this thing. I thought, oh my God, I didn't realise where that had come from. So I think, this has got a great potential um, as a therapeutic tool. It's looking back at it now, this after years, and realise that there is potential within this substance as a, a therapeutic tool with a psychotherapist or whatever uh, for the future. Not just for treating drug addiction, but something else. I think we're, we're really at a very, very early infant stage of looking into this substance. I'm really frightened when I hear the stories about what's going to happen with the drugs in the future with this. Tory government, uh, it, it, it's quite scary. So I began at the moment, I mean I can freely hold this here, this is a packet of root bark which I purchased from Iboga World, I, hope I made some product placement there, but it is an unlicensed substance in the UK, it can be bought over the internet, I wouldn't recommend people do it by themselves, but this is just the raw root bark, you wouldn't really get incredibly high off this, this small amount. But addicts use it after doing their flood dose of Ibogaine um, as, as aftercare, using small amounts of this, microdosing small amounts of, of Iboga can help with recovery. And I know it helps. And I've been in that boat. With me, I found after. Um, two days of this intensely grueling um, trip, I, the withdrawal symptoms just washed away. I was tired out, I found it a bit hard to walk, but after years of methadone addiction, I'd broken the habit. 
I'm not, I have to say it's not a cure for drug addiction, but it's certainly a tool that can help many, many people. It helped me, and I went back on the journey uh, two years, two or three years ago to make a, a follow-up documentary because I had such, so many tossed testimonials from individuals who had said they had been helped from watching Detox or Die. I didn't set out to make a piece of propaganda to make money out of it for, for myself uh, on, you know, uh, doing Ibogaine therapies or whatever, but people used that film to go on their own journey. And if it helped them, that's good. I never th set out to do that, but uh, it seems like the, the film is out there for people to use. And that, that, that can only be a good thing with the amount of exploitative, rubbish documentaries that I'm seeing on TV. I thought, well, something that is bringing good into the world, that, that's, that's got to mean something. Um, so if that's all I get remembered for, because I do make other films, um, but if that's all I get remembered for, then so be it. And it's a joy to be invited to uh, a, an event like this, to speak openly, um, about this bizarre psychedelic from, from the depths of Africa and how much it can help individuals. I had a bunch of other stuff on there to show you. I never timed this, but I suppose it seemed to be coming to a natural conclusion at the moment. I noticed I had a five minute uh, thing coming up there with Cameron. So yes, it, um, it certainly has potential uh, to help with many struggling drug addicts. And I think there are various other substances as well uh, used by indigenous peoples like ayahuasca, uh, peyote, um, these things have been found to help with cocaine and uh, alcohol addiction. Um, and it's not necessarily a bad thing to go out of your own country, out of your own space into these, these places with the tribal folks and do it. Um, I think sometimes the imagery can actually help as well. I did it with just, just dressing in a certain style and creating this. Um, strangely enough, when I, I washed the face paint off, I had the shroud. I thought, I'll keep the shroud, just put it in my case and take it home, uh, just as a memento of it. For some strange reason, and I don't know why, but when I got back home, I opened the case and I was kind of looking for it. This, where's this shroud? I couldn't find it, it disappeared. So I think it was meant to go. I'm not, it probably wasn't mystical. I'm sure I mislaid it, but it was almost like it was meant to be. A, you know, shedding the methadone ghost that I was. Um, yeah, certainly I begin gives us, on the whole, gives addicts a six-month respite uh, from addiction. Two people do sometimes relapse after that six month period, but it might be a good idea where they, they try some more, do a microdosing. Um, as I said, it's, it's, it needs to be out there being uh, analysed by people within the medical communities. I hope next uh, two years time there'll be more people here talking about Ibogaine. I thought there would be more, more talks on it. Uh, but um, yeah, if you want to do some more exploration of this, check my films out. They're free to watch and um, get back to me. Ask me as a be a friend on Facebook and we can discuss it. If you've got any friends struggling with addiction, uh, give me a shout and be quite happy to chat. I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm a, just a documentary maker. You know, I don't do treatments myself. So, um, yeah. Thank you very much. I think I've got one minute in which to... <laughs>